Hey guys, thanks for joining me for this 25th episode of Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests for this episode include author Tim O'Brien. We'll be talking about the new documentary, The War and Peace of Tim O'Brien. We'll also visit with our good friend Allison Sweeney. Got an upcoming movie, Chronicle Mysteries, Help to Death, that premieres on Sunday on the Hallmark Movies and Mystery Channel. We'll also visit with Senator James Lankford, talking about the blizzards and weather conditions, plus the possibility of a next stimulus. And we'll finally wrap up the show with rocker Damon Johnson. Got a brand new album to talk about coming out tomorrow, Battle Lessons. Again, if you would, please take the time to subscribe, drop a like, comment, leave some feedback, and share with your friends. Well, our first guest is Tim O'Brien, the author. Got a brand new documentary to talk about, The War and Peace of Tim O'Brien, which is available on VOD in March. First off, Tim, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Now, Tim, after doing so much writing, I mean, did was the documentary idea, was that something that even was of interest when it uh, was first brought to you, if you will? Not really, no. I declined when uh, Aaron Matthews, the filmmaker, asked me to do it. There just wasn't, in my opinion, enough dramatic about my life. It, why would people be interested in, in a guy sitting in front of a computer all day? But uh, Aaron, Aaron convinced me that it took about three months for him to convince me that people might be fascinated by somebody struggling over four or five years to write a book. That ordinarily, I think people just read a book and think the writer, you know, dashed it off pretty much in the time it took to read it. But after, uh, you know, four or five years go into it for me, and Aaron, Aaron wore me down and I did it. <laughs> now, now the uh, as the process of the of the documentary unfolded, what was what was maybe the biggest uh, was there was there an eye opening moment where you were like, well, may, maybe this really is something that uh, something special. Yeah, there's one moment in the documentary that a lot of your listeners will identify with. I I'd gotten fed up with my two boys for being online and playing video games constantly. So I sat him down, forgetting the camera was even there, and told him that was the end. I was going to throw their computers out the window and their iPads and their and their iPhones. And for the next hour or so, there was a pretty ferocious conversation between my, my, my kids and me. I tried to hold the line. I managed for 45 minutes not to compromise, saying it, the, all the electronics, that was history. But gradually, I was worn down. So we reached a compromise where for two and a half hours a day, except school days, they could do it. Well, that compromise worked for maybe half an hour, and then it was out the window. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think everybody in your audience who has kids knows knows what I'm talking. <laughs> I feel the pain, Tim. Now the, yeah. uh, the 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 war in peace uh, of Tim O'Brien. Uh, where is the where did the fascination for war and and the, the the stories of war in our everyday lives? When did when did you know that that talking about war, writing about war, was was the the, the line for you, if you will? Well, it happened to me back in the Vietnam War. I was drafted. I went to Vietnam and I served as an infantryman out in the rice paddies, you know, up in the mountains. Came home alive, unlike some of my friends, and uh, I've been dealing with it pretty much ever since. Uh, I'm not obsessed by it, but my dreams are still full of it when I sleep. Sometimes even my daydreams, I'll kind of glaze out, and for a few seconds, I'll be back in Vietnam. And I've written about it. I've written three books about it one of which is taught in most of the schools in this country, high schools and in colleges, called the things they carried. So because of the books, it's even more in my face. I'm, I do interviews and speak at colleges and that sort of thing. For most Americans uh, now, it, because it's an all-volunteer army, it really isn't a part of most people's lives at all, unless you happen to have a son or a 
husband or a wife or a daughter who is in a war over in the Middle East, then it is in your face. You're worried constantly. You hope nothing bad happens to your, you know, your husband or your son. But it's always on your mind. Back in my era, because of the draft, it was in everybody's face all the time. Wondering, will that draft notice come? Will my son have to go off to a war? Nobody was immune from it. But today, I think it's only one half of 1% of our country has to worry about it at all. And, and in the, uh, the, the, the the documentary, The War and Peace of Tim O'Brien, how, how do you, what do you think is the, the biggest takeaway that, uh, that the viewers will see? If there's one big one, it's pretty obvious. It's my love for my children, my two sons, one of who's now 17. It seems impossible. The other is 15. And uh, for those who will watch the documentary or those who already have, my own dad was a terrible alcoholic. He wasn't physically present a lot of the time. And even when he was present, he wasn't emotionally there. He was elsewhere. Um, he was a great man, a good father in a lot of ways, but it was chemistry and biology and alcohol. So I want to give my sons through the my new book called Dad's Maybe Book, I want to give them the gift of their own dad, um, how much I love them and how I think about them constantly, as I guess all parents do. Uh, there's one difference with me. I'm 74 years old. I had my kids really late in life. So you, not in the not-too-distant future, they're not going to have a dad. That's just how... The world works. And through, uh, through this book, and I hope even through the documentary, when they watch it when they're 30 years old or 40 years old, they'll see that love on the screen and they'll feel it inside the pages of the book, uh, what I really don't have. So it's a, in a way, the documentary is really a gift to my children. And again, it is uh, available on uh, video on demand on March 2nd. Again, uh, The War in Peace of Tim O'Brien. And Tim, I always want to make sure and, and let folks know if they want to find out more info about uh, not only the documentary, but uh, all of the books, where's the, where's the best place to, to find out all the information, my friend? I would say Amazon would be the obvious place to go where you can get either the book or the movie or both. Uh, it's most most people know how to get on Amazon, so that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, Tim, it has been great to visit with you this morning. Looking forward to checking out the the documentary and uh, your latest books as well. And hopefully, we can catch up again real soon, my friend. Thank you for having me. Again, be sure and check out that documentary, "The War and Peace of Tim O'Brien." Well, a lot of people have had to drive in the snow for the first time this week, especially here in the South. But whether you're new to it or not, almost no one enjoys it. Well, a new survey found that 73% of Americans are scared to drive in snow and ice, and one in seven have no confidence in themselves. Now, here are five more quick stats on winter's driving. People in the Northeast are the most likely to say they hate driving in snow, followed by people in the South and both were just slightly higher than average. Now, women and young people are more likely to say that it's intimidating. 23% of women said they're not confident at all, compared to just 8% of men. To which I say, our RS guys, are we a little too confident? Anyway, over half of us have gotten a car stuck in the snow before. 48% of us were never taught how to drive in winter conditions. 35% don't know what to do if their car starts to skid, and one in three have been in a winter weather-related crash. Now, the top things that we do when the roads start feeling dangerous are slow down, turn down our music to focus, and one in four said they just start praying. Well, our next guest is our good friend Allison Sweeney. Got an upcoming movie, Chronicle Mysteries, Help to Death, that premieres this Sunday at 8, 7 Central on Hallmark Movies and Mystery Channel. 
First off, Allison, always great to visit with you, my friend. Oh, great to talk to you, too. Now, Allison, tell us uh, how excited you are. The, the, the Hallmark Movies and Mysteries, the, the extension of the Chronicle Mystery Series as well, coming up Sunday. Yeah, I'm so excited. This is the fifth movie in the Chronicle Mysteries franchise. And it's just been so fun. I love the response we've gotten from the fans and how excited they are to see my character, Alex, the podcaster, and what her new case is going to be. And um, I personally, you know, I'm really into true crime, and I love those podcasts. I love that that armchair detective uh, energy and enthusiasm from from people. And now there's so many documentaries out there. Uh, that that we can watch about all this uh, stuff. And so I feel like the energy is just so right for these movies because Help to Death is really celebrating that and, and, and reflecting some of those real-life cases that are out there that intrigue me. Now, also, you got a, a little extra special uh, co-star on this one as well. Oh, my gosh. I can't. It's such a great story. But my friend, Christian Alfonso, who played Hope, of course, on Days for Our Lives for many years, and she and I have been friends for longer than I, I, I stopped counting a long time ago. And um, and she was up in Vancouver filming a different project. And it just worked out so perfectly to ask her to come and, and do a little cameo on my movie. And it was like a dream come true to, first of all, because you know, we, after the quarantining and you're kind of in isolation a little bit, working on these projects in a bubble, trying to be safe. And so to see a friend from home, a friendly face was literally like heaven. And I cried when I saw her. It made me so happy. Now, now for you, when when uh, you started out with the first Chronicle Mystery, I mean, how much has your, your vision changed as, as each one has progressed? Yeah, it's been fun to watch the development of the characters and you know for example with Alex she started off kind of half her foot out the door like she wasn't even planning to stay in Harrington Pennsylvania and then over the course of the movies she falls in love with the town and uh, definitely I think the audience sees that she and uh, Drew have have some chemistry between them and they should date and but of course they're slow and taking their time so we're stretching that relationship out as long as we possibly can but in this movie you're going to see some real pro- forward progress between the two of them and see them really connect with each other in a way that we haven't shown before so i think it was perfect next step for these two characters so you get a little romance in this movie as well and um and meanwhile you know they're out there solving cases and this one is fun because we did really recreate that sort of camp wilderness retreat uh experience so alex and drew don't have their modern electronics and conveniences to solve this case they're really out there on their own kind of using more like old-fashioned uh their basic senses and some good old-fashioned detective work to figure it out now also uh, s- some other exciting news especially for the the fans of sammy uh doing a, a, a guest starring role back on days what's uh, w- what's that all about allison what is that all about <laughs> i mean where do i begin I, believe me, I'm sure that's exactly what the other people in Salem are going to be saying to Sammy when they when they catch wind of her back in town. But um, it's it's always fun for me when the producers of Days uh, ask me to come back and and do a little uh, story arc. And for me, it's a joy. I love playing Sammy. I've played Sammy more than half of my life. In okay. fact, I I did an interview with Kelly Clarkson, and she commented that my son is now as old as I was when I got the job at Dave. And I like, I literally, my jaw dropped. I was, I was like, Oh, I can't, I can't believe that's real life. <laughs> um, so that, that was sort of a meta moment for me. And, and anyway, so it's, it's a part of who I am. And when they asked me to come back, I always say yes, because I love playing Sammy so much and I love the crew and the cast there. So yeah, my, I think my shows start airing next week, actually. Wow. Now, now for, for you, Allison, this, uh, th- this latest project, how much different do things look now as opposed to the, to the last, uh, the last Chronicle series, if you will? Well, what was your question? How does it look? Does it how, look how, how did the, the working on the project, how, how much oh, different yeah, well, did it have to look? Oh my gosh. It's, to- you know, first of all, because of everything going on, we had to make all the adjustments for everybody's safety. And, um, and that's really hard. It's, it, I, I mean, everyone knows 
obviously how hard that is. And um, so when you're trying to, the good news for this, and it wasn't on purpose, it just happened to be that we were filming a movie that mostly takes place outside. So that was really helpful. Um, and But of course, it's still Vancouver. So it, boy, it rained almost every night. And then the next day, the path up to the forest where we were filming was like muddy and the gators wouldn't even go up the trail. So now the crew is like carrying all this heavy equipment every morning. I just was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, um, you know, what we're doing and how amazing the crew is to tough it out and make it happen. But it was, it was challenging. Uh, it was definitely challenging. So I, I hope we can get back to normal soon. But in the meantime, we, um, we're really excited to be able to work at all, honestly. That's right. Now, now, Allison, what is what's the biggest thing that you learned uh, about yourself in 2020? What uh, everybody got time to to spend alone a little bit? What uh, yeah, what did right? you pull out of it? Well, I guess you know, for me, it was really my kids and I felt a little like Little House on the Prairie, just staying at home and baking bread and uh, doing homework together. And I was sort of making them do exercises in the backyard to stay active and and we just had a lot of time together and my husband of course was still working so um the three of us were just in our own little bubble or pod or whatever you call it and we were doing our thing and connecting with each other in a way in some ways you know I'll look back on it so fondly of the time I got to spend with them but I but it also is very crystallized by the amount of dishes I did I I just I just really need to, I need that to not happen so much anymore. That was a lot, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of cleaning up. A lot of cooking, a lot of cleaning up. Well, again, Allison, plenty of things coming. Uh, again, uh, guest role of Sammy back on Days uh, starting next week. The upcoming movie, Chronicle Mysteries, Help to Death, uh, premieres this Sunday. And Allison, always want to make sure and let everybody know where they can keep up with uh, with everything you got going social media-wise as oh, well. Oh, yeah, for sure. So Chronicle Mysteries, Help to Death, premieres on Hallmark Movies and Mysteries. So be sure to tune in on Sunday night. And then you can find Chronicle Mysteries on Instagram at Chronicle Mysteries. And you can find me at Allie Sweeney or at Allie underscore Sweeney on, on Twitter. And I'm going to be doing a giveaway on Sunday night during the premiere and um, having like a really fun Twitter party talking about the movie and all the clues and who they think did it. So uh, all the fans should tune in to um, join the conversation with us on Twitter on Sunday night. All right. Well, Allison, it is always great to visit with you. I, I hope you have a great weekend and uh, looking forward to, to the new series this weekend. Thank you so much. Again, be sure and follow her on Twitter for that live giveaway this Sunday. Now, here's a guy who did not let being alone ruin his Valentine's Day. Well, a couple in Maine left their house for an overnight trip on Sunday, and when they got home the next morning, they realized someone had broken in and was still there. So they called 911. Well, it turned out that a 34-year-old guy from Norway named Sean Schoonmaker had broken into their house on Valentine's Day and, well, made himself at home. He parked in their garage, rummaged through their stuff, made dinner, and then took a romantic candlelit bath. Now, he also rearranged a bunch of their stuff, including family photos, and he smoked cigarettes in, quote, every room. Now, cops showed up and arrested him, and he's facing charges for burglary and theft. Up next is Senator James Lankford. We'll be talking about some of those serious weather conditions, plus the possibility of a next stimulus. First off, Senator, always good to visit with you, my friend. It's great to visit with you as well in the middle of this frozen tundra that we're currently <laughs> living in. Yeah, and uh, we, we, we've all had to do things a little different. Well, uh, Senator, I think this may, this last year has trained us for, uh, for, for being locked in at home for a blizzard, right? <laughs> you know, I, told, I think I told you before at the end of last year that 2020 was just a practice round for 2021. <laughs> and uh, that, that has proved to be true so far. And uh, as we start 2021, obviously uh, a change in leadership. And uh, as you start the new year, Senator, what are what are the goals that you have for for 2021 as as we're just getting underway? Yeah, well, I have several goals. Actually, we're trying to be able to work through how we're handling schools. Obviously, we got to get through COVID uh, time period. We've got a lot of issues that we have in our economy and restarting 
Uh, I have switched committees actually in Washington, D.C., and moved over to what's called the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And I will also be the ranking member on a committee on energy policy. And uh, so I want to try to zero in more on uh, what we can actually get done in Oklahoma. As, as we've seen through this time period with rolling blackouts, uh, if we don't get the energy mix correctly, uh, it has a real-life and real-world effect on us. So oil, gas, coal, wind, uh, solar power, hydroelectric, nuclear, uh, all those are important to be able to sustain our economy, but also they're just vital to be able to help us in critical moments like what we have right now. And if we get the mix wrong, uh, we have real problems. So I've just shifted over in the last week uh, to stepping into this issue and figure out how we can make sure that we can protect us uh, as Americans and as our economy and, quite frankly, individual families. And, and Senator, obviously, it's it's always frustrating when you're without certain conveniences and, and, and you, you know, electricity, the rolling blackouts, like you mentioned. C- can you explain that just a little bit to the to the listeners that, that, that get so frustrated by that? Why those rolling blackouts are necessary? Yeah, th- this has been a big issue, uh, obviously, all over uh, Oklahoma and all of our region, but an even bigger issue in Texas. Uh, so we had a, um, a whole a whole group of things. I've, I've said to folks, this is not one person sitting at a switchboard somewhere flipping the wrong switch. This is a whole series of issues that have actually occurred uh, that have led us to this moment. Uh, obviously, the very low temperatures uh, that drives a greater need for natural gas because we heat our homes and, and businesses with natural gas. Uh, but a lot of the wells have frozen up. Uh, people don't know that if, if you're not in oil and gas, but uh, when gas is actually produced, there's also water that's in, mixed into that as well as that water is coming through the well and you're at, you know, negative four degrees. Uh, it freezes up the well and uh, suddenly you're not producing gas anymore. It's as, as, as if the, the well is actually frozen up. Uh, so if you can't get gas, they can't produce uh, electricity in a natural gas facility uh, for electricity. And it also drives the issue for our homes as well. Uh, right now, with all the freezing uh, temperatures and the uh, moisture coming down, it's also freezing up wind towers. Uh, so solar panels are down. They're covered with snow. Uh, wind towers are down because they're frozen up. Natural gas, uh, we stopped the production line coming in. So we've had to dramatically increase the amount of coal that we're using uh, to be able to actually generate our heat. And it's just not enough uh, in the mix for our base power. Uh, so we literally don't have enough base power uh, to be able to heat us at the moment when we need it the most. Uh, so it, it's a whole series of things that have all come together uh, that we've got to figure out how to be able to unwind. And Senator, obviously, uh, the, the, the stimulus, uh, the, the next uh, round, if you will, that, that that's still on the table being being talked about. Where where are we with, uh, with, with the, the next COVID plan, if you will? So interestingly enough, everybody's talking about the next COVID plan, uh, and uh, but they've not really focused on the last one that's still not out the door. Uh, we had a, almost a trillion dollars in just at the very end of December that we allocated to additional COVID expenses. Uh, that was schools, that was vaccines, that was testing supplies, uh, that was emergency monies. Uh, all of those things were set aside at the end of December, almost a trillion dollars. Only a third of that money is even out the door. Uh, the Biden team walked in immediately and said, we need another two trillion. Uh, we've set a quick time out and said, hold, hold on, before you ask for two trillion dollars more that we have to borrow from China, why don't we figure out what is needed at this point? We haven't even spent the last money and you're asking for a whole lot more. So th- there are critical aspects that need to be done. Uh, things like uh, sustaining small businesses, people with unemployment assistance, uh, ways to be able to help people get through this crisis. But we need to we need to borrow as much money as we need to get through it. But we don't need to borrow a dollar more than what we need, because all this has to be paid back with interest uh, when it's over. So we, we've got to be careful. Almost uh, almost five trillion dollars so far has been borrowed just in 2020 uh, to be able to pay for covid expenses. So anything else we add to this, we've got to be really cautious. This is why even last summer uh, there was a big conversation to say right after the CARES Act passed in March. Let's do another one. We stalled it out for months and said, let, let, let's not jump into the next expense until we know what we really need. And then when we know what we need, let's let's borrow what we need to be able to do it. But let's be cautious with it as well. 
And and Senator, as as you walk into the to the to the building each day, I know eat different buildings, especially historical buildings. It seems like they have their own personality. Has has the personality of the building? Have you noticed a, a big change in that over the last, say, the last eighteen months? <laughs> Uh, there, there's been a big change uh, in the last couple of months that uh, you get around D.C. is more like a fortress now uh, with huge walls and barriers all around the city and with natural uh, na- National Guard walking around. It is a very different feel uh, than what it did just a couple of months ago after after January 6th. Uh, that National Guard uh, presence has reduced but has not dropped. And those walls that are all around the city are jarring to be able to see. And uh, it, it is a little bit odd, uh, even in the conversation, even in the side by side, talking about Washington, D.C., when uh, President Biden is trying to uh, has stopped any wall building on our southern border for immigration protection. But he is rapidly building walls through D.C. Uh, I've, I've jokingly said if walls work here, they probably work in other places as well. And uh, we need to be able to figure out how to be able to balance out our national security but also access to our systems. That's right. And, and Senator, if, if folks have uh, questions, would like more information, I know you keep the website up to date. And uh, is that the best place to, to find the information to reach out, sir? Yeah, it's a great way to be able to do it at langford.senate.gov, langford.senate.gov. Uh, they can go there. They can get all the contact information and call our offices in Oklahoma or in Washington, D.C. You can email us from there. You can track the things that we're working on right now. We're currently in the process of working on disaster uh, funds for Oklahoma uh, and making some of those formal requests. I've, I've got a letter we just sent out to the uh, CDC uh, to be able to push them because they've not given guidance yet on people that have had their vaccine, uh, what they can get out and do. So we've had senior adults that have not seen their families for a year, uh, but now I've had the vaccine and CDC has not given any guidance on that. That's a real problem. Obviously, it's a mental health issue, but it's a hope issue. Uh, as well, that people say, I finally got the vaccine. Now, what can I do? And CDC is still saying, wait, we'll we'll tell you later. Uh, they need to get that guidance out. So th- there's a lot of items we're working on. If you want to keep up with that, you can go to our website uh, or you can contact us and we can help any way we can. All right. Well, Senator, always great to visit with you, my friend. I uh, I hope you endure through the, uh, the, the cold snap that we're going through and uh, look forward to talking to you again real soon, my friend. I look forward to it as well. Take care and uh, stay warm. And for all those folks that are out there working on wellheads and working on power lines on our behalf right now, thank you very much and stay safe. Again, you can follow him on all the socials at Senator Lankford. Well, today is National Drink Wine Day because, well, clearly everyone's struggling to find an excuse to drink wine these days. So when you're drinking wine, how many glasses do you usually put down in one sitting? Well, according to a survey, 74% of people have had one or two glasses, but 9% drink at least five glasses or, well, just finish the entire bottle. Now, 18% of people say Merlot is their favorite type of wine. 16% say Zinfandel. Coming in third, quote, I don't know my wine types. (laughs) Now, the survey also found 9% of people say that wine gives them worse hangovers than any other type of alcohol. 9% always buy boxed wine, and 3% said they always cry when they drink wine. Well, our next guest, no crying here, rocker Damon Johnson got a brand new album coming out tomorrow called Battle Lessons. And I had the chance actually two years ago to watch Damon at a show there in Nashville. And, uh, well, Damon, you remember that show? You know, I had gone through that crowdfunding Mm -hmm. experience with Pledge Music. And, um, you know, man, my fans were so amazing and so supportive. And uh, so we went with a different company for this new album to do the pre-order. And, man, everything went flawlessly. Uh, we, you know, we went with a different company. This one was Indiegogo. And, man, they were great. And the fans loved it. They got to get all kinds of unique stuff, exclusive stuff, pre-order the CD and the vinyl. So, uh, yeah, man, I'll never forget that night in Nashville. Brad Whitford 
There you go. Yeah, that, was, that, yeah, that was I... that was amazing. I, I saw the list when we when uh, you know we were there for CMA Fest because we have a country station as well, and we got the the list and we're like, okay, we're gonna get a, a night away from country. That was good stuff. <laughs> now, now tell us t- tell us, Damon, a, a little bit about battle lessons and, and maybe what you learned uh, as you go go into the the Indiegogo pre order and everything this time around. Well. Man, there's so much, you know, there's so much that has happened. I guess it's worth noting that these songs were all written before the pandemic. Uh, I basically started demoing the bulk of these ideas in October of 2019. Um, You know, we went into the studio with Nick Raskulinix in February, which was uh, an honor and a pledge, man. You know, Nick is super busy and he's producing bands with far bigger budgets than I have. <laughs> you know, so it was uh, it was really it was really a thrill for me that he got so excited about the songs. He could tell I'd done a lot of work, and you know, I showed up really prepared. So, you know, then the COVID hit and it affected the schedule and slowed everything down. I had already planned to do, you know, a crowdfunding thing and uh, had done some research, and so we had started that, but we had to hit pause on that as well because of the pandemic. So we did a unique thing, Cameron, in that we did, uh, we had kind of like phase one and phase two. Again, the fans have been super patient, super supportive, um, and, you know, it really gave me kind of some operating capital, man, to hire a first-class producer, get the best guy to master the record, get the best artwork, the best publicist, all this stuff. So, um, man, I'm, I'm just, I got so much gratitude to my fans, and I'm really thrilled with how everything has turned out. And, and Battle Lessons is, is going to be available tomorrow. And uh, for you, Damon, do you sleep the night before a release, or, or is it just uh, pure adrenaline? <laughs> It's pure adrenaline, brother. I haven't slept this whole week, and it's not from worrying. Man, used to, I would worry. And even in this pandemic, man, like, I'm so proud of these songs. I have no question uh, the quality of the sound of the record, the composition of the record, the performances on the record. It's... um, I guess I'm just feeding off that adrenaline of knowing it's just like you and I talking right now. There's, there's, none of this would have happened if it weren't for the quality of this record. So it's a celebration, man. Uh, I'm probably going to sleep very hard on Saturday <laughs> night. <laughs> now, now, Damon, what what is the what is the biggest thing that you have missed over the last say twelve months since pandemic and and is it the friendships? Is it the 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 the, the jam out sessions? What what is it that you miss the most? Yeah, man. You know, the world of touring has so many components of it, and you know, I definitely love to perform. I love the lights and the sound and the volume and the fans and the adulation, big or small, man. I love all of that. I really miss being with the guys. You know, even though Jared and Robbie both live here in Nashville, um, you know, and we, we definitely visited a coffee shop or two, you know, sitting outdoors in recent months. But, you know, man, I just miss hanging with those guys. We've got so much in common musically. Uh, I would have never dreamt I would have a power trio, Cameron. Um, I'm so proud of, proud of this band. I'm proud of what we're doing musically. Um, the guys just, they're so much fun, man. They crack me up. We have great discussions. Uh, and I miss that. I just miss, I just miss traveling with them, you know, showing up at the airport together, you know, eating bad fast food in some dressing room, you know, (laughs) opening for a cool band like UFO or Clutch. You know, we, 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 we had a lot of great experiences in the last two years. So, uh, I can't wait, man. There's no question that we feel that Battle Lessons is going to kind of give us a little bit more of a thrust out of the starting gate, you know, once we're able to get back out and start playing shows, man. we got a great new record to play for people to talk about. Um, you know, I, I'm excited at the possibility that it's going to open some more doors for us. 
Now, Damon, you talked about uh, all of the, 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 the music was done, the, the, the writing and everything was done pre-pandemic. What, what is the, what's the look of the music or the inspiration over the last 12 months? Did that change for you? I felt like, um, you know, I could, of course, we could have never guessed, the, uh, you know, what a blessing it was to kind of have a great record already written and in the can. Mm-hmm. We, we did get one new song, uh, you know, after the, the lockdowns had happened. And that's a great, great track. Uh, track number four is called Shadow Country. And it was inspired by the great book by Peter Matheson of the same title. That was the name of his book. But I just felt like some parallels with other lyrics on the record that dealt with me sort of celebrating my past, revisiting some challenges and frustrations from my past. But just the fact, man, that you can just work and work and work and you can chip away at the stone and nothing really happens until finally you hit it one time and it breaks open and you you accomplish what you've worked so hard to do. And it wasn't that one blow that broke that open. It was all of the blows that had happened before. All of that plays a part of it. Sorry to wax philosophical on you, but that just really spoke to me, man. And, and that's been a big part of, you know, the whole record. And, and I don't know, man, I, we wouldn't have had that song had it not been for the, the pandemic and the, and the lockdown. That's right. And again, uh, check out the, uh, the the new video. The album release, Battle Lessons, uh, is uh, it's tomorrow. Damon Johnson and the Get Ready. And Damon, always want to make sure and let our listeners know where to keep up with everything social media-wise, website, all that as well. Thank you so much, Cameron. DamonJohnson.com. It can't be any easier than that. Everything is there. People can... People can order the CD. They can order the vinyl. We got the beautiful 180 gram vinyl. We're expecting delivery of those in just a couple weeks. I'm on all the platforms, brother. Uh, official Damon Johnson at Facebook and at Instagram, and then my Twitter is Damon J Official. Um, we're partying on all platforms all weekend, man. So come and say hello for sure. There you go. Well, Damon, always great to visit with you, my friend. Uh, Continued success on the new album, and uh, hopefully we can catch up again real soon. Cameron, thanks so much, buddy. All the best. And uh, yeah, man, let's, let's get some FaceTime really soon. Thanks. Again, thanks for joining me for this 25th episode of Good Questions with Cameron Dole here in Season 2. If you ever have a comment, a question, or anything else you'd like to know, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for the podcast, you can click the support tab and follow the instructions. And if you have a special guest idea, email me, gqwithcam at gmail.com. Again, thanks so much to Brandon Allen for coming up with the theme for Good Questions with Cameron Dole. We're going to let him play us out and uh, hope you enjoy the new website. If you haven't checked it out yet, go on over to gqwithcam.com. Com. Hope you guys have a great rest of your Thursday. Dylan Howard, one of the guests, coming up tomorrow.